<laughs> All right, okay, well, welcome to the Fanographics, the next generation panel. We're, we're basically focusing on the, this is for like Fanographics 2.0, the people who potentially grew up reading Fanographics, whereas, the, you know, for somebody like for my generation, you know, we were, like, they read the people that, that, you know, so Fanographics was in their template to begin with, and now here they are being published by Fanographics, so it's a slightly different experience, and I'm just gonna go down the line. I'm guessing most of you know who the people here are already. This is Anya Davidson, who's known for publishing a lot of zines. She did School Spirits with Picture Box, and then now she just has Band for Life from Fanographics that's premiering at the show. Noah Van Skyver, the hardest working man in competition with Simon for doing the most comics per day. And he's been <laughs> publishing, self-publishing, and published by a lot of different publishers, but now is also being published by Fanographics. Ben Mara is published under his own imprint, Traditional Comics, for many years and has now you know, graduated or, or transitioned into being published by Fanographics as well. And his new book that I think was premiering today is actually collecting your traditional comics. Yep. So I don't know if it's all of them, but Most a of great them. many of them. And then here's Simon Hanselman, the, you know, the wildly popular and usually successful creator of <laughs> Meg Mog and Al, the international really sensation, successful. straight from his world tour. And then we have Julia Gafour, who I didn't prepare an introduction for, but it's also published by Fanographics. She has two books out, that one was reissued, and then she has her new book, and also premiering at this show, I believe. So we have a lot of Fanographics premieres here at this show. And so basically, I'm just gonna just sort of, because this is the theme, is Fanographics 40th anniversary, we're sort of gonna, I'm gonna try to, focus a little bit on everybody's like path to fanographics, but also you know what differentiates this generation's career path from the initial, like for yesterday's panel where we had like the founding fathers of fanographics and mothers um, who were there, uh, and we're gonna see a little bit. So first off, I guess I'm gonna start off like, the, uh, we'll just go down, I guess we'll just go down the line, but you can interject anytime. Like, did all of you, grow up at some point, and I presume, just dis discovered Fantagraphics titles, and what was your experience of first reading them, or did you notice that there was something different about Fantagraphics, or et cetera, et cetera? Does anybody want to start with that? You want to start down there? I'll start. <laughs> Go for it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I, I discovered Fantagraphics when I was like 13 years old in Tasmania, and I'd been reading a lot of like Tintin and Asterix, and I like had a dalliance with superheroes. But then I found like Dan Clowes and Pete Bag, and it just blew my mind. I never looked back. I, I had a Fantagraphics poster on my wall for like, well, I still do, since I was 13. It's all tobacco stained. And when I got published, I, I stuck a little picture of Meg on there. It's like all the characters from like the 90s dancing. Everyone Fantagraphics dances to a different beat. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's an embarrassing poster. Um, Gary hates it. Um, but. <laughs> But yeah, it's been a lifelong love affair with Fanagraphics, and it's it's been cool to have that teen dream come true. And now I get to hang out in the office, like because I live in Seattle, and it's it's filthy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, does anyone else want to add? To, I mean, I'd like to hear. You know, um, I started out on like a more of a fine art career path. I I I wanted to do. I started majoring in illustration because I wanted to draw like pictures of things, but. Uh, then I switched to a painting and printmaking major and I really wanted to be like a fine art museum gallery kind of artist and uh, my teachers were always telling me like, well this is like really narrative, like uh, why would you want to draw a picture of a thing when you could just like have a photo of a thing, like why does it need to be, uh, why does there need to be all this story around it? Um, and the first fanographics artist that I remember reading was in college, uh, probably Dan Clowes and Dame Darcy so I was aware of Fanographics as like, as the cool, like big art comics publisher. And I went to college in Seattle, so. Ah. And then like uh, uh, in The Stranger, there would be um, like Al Columbia was in there and, and uh, Chris Ware, and that was a big deal to me too. And that was how I first found out that comics were a much cooler medium than fine art. <laughs> <laughs> right. I think I, I got like the catalog from Fanographics that mailed to me when I was a kid, and I used to confuse Fanographics with Kitchen Sink Press <laughs> a bunch because they both had like these dueling catalogs. Um, but I liked the uh, Crumb, uh, the complete Crumb mm. books that were coming out. And um, I can't remember Black Hole, the original 
Well, kitchen. Well, that would be interesting. That you mentioned the confusing oh. because Black Hole started. The first three issues were from Kitchen Sink, and then Fantagraphics took over. I think with four, and oh, then really? eventually reprinted one, two, and three. Okay. But so there you have it. That's yeah. in a nutshell. Black right. Hole yeah, was so the Black cause Hole, for the confusion. Black Hole was like a really big, yeah. you know, thing for me because it looked so different from everything else, and it was so like razor sharp, you know. Um, but I think that that was my first introduction to Fantagraphics. And then it really started to, I don't know, uh, coalesce around, you know, Klaus's uh, collections and books like A Velvet Glove, Cast in Iron. That was sort of like mm -hmm. what cemented, in my mind, what, what Fantagraphics was, what it meant. Um, so that was, yeah, that was my sort of okay. history with it. Um, you close it this. <laughs> yeah, uh, I just saw that movie Crumb when I was like 18 years old. And uh, I didn't know you could do comics like that at the time, so that movie like opened it up, and I started. I went to the comic book shop, and I asked if they had any Robert Crumb comics, and they had one volume of the complete Crumb, and it was behind the counter. So they're like, "Oh yeah, we have, I think we have one back here." <laughs> and so I bought that, and I, I got like really into it, and I started trying to seek out more of the complete Crumbs. And so I went to the Fantagraphics website, and it said like, "Publisher of the world's greatest cartoonist." And I was like, "Holy shit!" And I started like looking at everything they had on there, and that's when I got into like. Dan Klaus and, you know, everybody, like, Pete Bag and stuff. But, like, back then, like, I had no idea. Like, if you Googled, like, Daniel Klaus, I just wanted to see what he looked like. There was, like, no pictures of him. Like, <laughs> there was, yeah, I had no idea what he actually – there was, like, one old website. It was, like, an Angel Fire website <laughs> that had this, like, tiny little picture of him, but he was, like, you know, probably in his 20s or something. Yeah. So I was just like, oh, I guess that's him. And he was, he was so mysterious at that time. You like, know? like Thomas Pynchon of Comics. Yeah, exactly. There's that one like creepy self-portrait of him in Ghost World where he's like in the back doing a signing. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, I came um, to comics a little bit like Julia through fine art. I went to school for painting, but when I was 18, um, I, m I moved to Chicago to go to college and I met my bandmates um, that I was in a band with for a long time. And um, one of the drummers had a, a tattoo of the snoid on his hand, crumbs. Oh. Yeah, um, little guy who lives in people's butts, right? <laughs> and um, he, his dad uh, had run a comic shop in Chicago. Um, they sold a lot of undergrounds and stuff, and then they got, I think they got shut down for selling, a, like, um, you know, like a comic for adult, like a, like a porn comic to, like a, like a child. Like, accident, like, I think, like, like his, his, Dad wasn't working that day. It was like one of the employees, and like somehow they got busted. So that shop got shut down, but they just had boxes of like classic undergrounds, like S. Clay Wilson and um, Spain Rodriguez and stuff at their house. So that was my introduction. Okay. Um, <laughs> that sounds good. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, well, I guess. We're gonna just you know, we're gonna continue down the path. So you all guys, you, you, we have you know you two, the two you started in the fine art. You guys were more into the comics from the get go, but yeah. still discovering them at various different ages. But and so I guess I want to say, when did you each of you coalesce the desire to like a, you know like make comics is like you know there's two kind of two prongs. One like I obsessively like I have the need I gotta make comics. I love making comics. And two. Did, when that transition to like, oh, I, could I possibly have a career making comics or do that professionally? Because those are two distinct uh, things. And so I guess, and and then the th it would uh, start there. Yeah. When I moved from Seattle to Portland, I uh, I was still kind of doing like mostly fine art, but I've been making zines since I was in high school. So like, I would do like little crummy looking comics as part of my zines and stuff and it wasn't something that I took seriously at all like that was not my art or my calling that's not how I thought of it but when I moved to Portland like all the people that I made friends with right away were cartoonists like I met Dylan Williams and I met Jesse Reckla and Sean Christensen and Andres Arp and and they kind of like were really uh welcoming in a way that fine art people are not like they had a much more like inclusive DIY like let's all get together an avant-garde anthology or whatever. And uh, Dylan was the person who was like, I like your comics, I like your fine art, I want to see you like bring your fine art aesthetic and make some comics that way, and offered to publish me if I would do that. And I loved Dylan, 
because he was a wonderful person. So I was like, you know, a, a lot of people, if they had been like, I want you to change your art, I would have been like, fuck off. But for Dylan, I did. And it was, I didn't expect very many people to read it, but it ended up being pretty popular. Like it was a book called Flesh and Bone. It got nominated for an Ignatz that year, which when I got the email, I didn't know what it was. I was like, what does this mean? <laughs> Uh, and it ended up being in Best American Comics that year too, and it was like the first time that I had made like an artistic product and really felt like I've knocked this out of the park. I'm really good at this, <laughs> so I just kind of I I went where the social uh, approval was. Right. Very good. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I uh, self-published my first zine when I was eight years old, and it's <laughs> I'm like Peter Pan. I never grew up. Uh, it just it's always been my obsession and like I said I had the Fanographics poster on the wall I just always wanted to be published by them predominantly and just I'd work day jobs and stay up all night drawing comics then vomiting in rubbish bins the next day at work just I, I, I don't know I had there's no reason to draw comics but I just pushed myself so hard and it's all that really gives me joy so I just kept on doing it I always said I wanted to be published by Fanographics b before I was 30 or like I signed my contract the day before I turned 31, so I, I, I just fucking made it. And it, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's very surreal. But yeah, I, I guess it was, I don't know, I'm derailing. That's no, enough. No, no, that's perfect. That's I enough. mean, I almost jumped to another <laughs> question, so like you've already... Okay, go ahead. For me, uh, I always wanted to make... I really liked, uh, I really loved comics when I was a kid growing up. Uh, I, I was part of that black and white boom in the 80s with TMNT. My first comic I ever bought was this Derek Robertson comic called Space Beaver, <laughs> which I, I, I loved deeply, still do. And uh, it, it like changed my life. I tried to make comics for years. I couldn't do it. It was very difficult. I couldn't like manage to do more than two pages and then I would just be like, this, this sucks. And I would want to do another idea. And I it couldn't. It takes time to get used to how fucking hard it is. Yeah. It's really labor intensive. Yeah. And I it feels wrong at first. Yeah, <laughs> I totally. I, I false started a number of times. And when I was in art school, I, I, I made a 10 page comic. And I tried to make a. I did a comic for my thesis in grad school, which I never finished. And then I l took what I learned from that and then made my first comic, which was like climbing a mountain. Um, it was called Night Business, the first one. Oh, yeah. And uh, after that, it got a lot easier. And now that's all I want to do. So that's all I'm going to do from now on. <laughs> so I'm just moving everything else out of the way at, the, at this point, just so I can clear the path to make more comics. And now it's just about speed. It's a race to the finish line for me now. Just try, try to get everything done that's sort of in the queue in my head. Hmm. All right, that's comics. Yeah. Uh, I was like, just drawing a lot. I always drew as a kid, like everybody, but like when I got a little older, I, I like stopped drawing and like started skateboarding and all this stuff. And then uh, then I just started picking up drawing a little bit more, just like in a sketchbook, but I was kind of directionless about like what I was going to do with it. But once I discovered like Robert Crumb and Fanographics and all this stuff, I, I got this book called uh, Rebel Visions, which was like all about the hippie comic movement and stuff. And it was like all about like, there's a lot of like how you could just do it yourself. Published by Fanographics. Yeah, published by Fanographics. And I was, like, really, like, influenced by that. Like, I actually, from that book, I actually thought that, like, every company had their own printing press. So, like, because, like, back then, that's how it was. Like, Last Gasp, like, you know, they all, like, printed their own comics and stuff. So I thought Fanographics had their own printing press and everything, and that's just how you did it. And so I was just trying to, like, recreate that. Like, I did, started doing my own mini comics with a photocopy machine next to where I worked. And I would just drop them off for free, like, on buses or, like, in coffee shops or record stores and stuff. Uh, and then I just kind of stuck with it, but like drawing was like really, I didn't even like really enjoy drawing. It like took a long time to actually like to make it like a habit and to like actually like have fun doing it because it, it was really hard. And uh, yeah, I don't know why I just like stuck with it, but. Uh, and now here's Anya Davidson. <laughs> Um, I, yeah, I was making zines in high school, like, like with pictures and words, but not comics. And then um, like the first kind of like, 24 page um, comic that I made was just like really kind of the result of like a, a mini nervous breakdown. And then um, 
I went on tour with my band and I had a bunch of copies of it and I was just giving it out to like everyone that we were hanging out with and um, we just ended up in, in Providence and um, I met um, Brian Chippendale and CF and um, I didn't know who they were and I didn't know that they made comics but I knew they were in this other band and these bands that we were playing with and I was just like, hey guys, want a zine? And they were like, oh yeah, we make comics too. Here, here are our zines. And they're, like, mine was like, like photocopied at Kinko's and theirs were like 24 color screen printed <laughs> like masterpieces. You gave one to Leslie Stein too, right? Uh, oh, that's a really yeah. I told yeah. yeah we stayed yeah we stayed with uh, Leslie Stein in New York, and I didn't know who she was, and I was like, oh, I you make comics, so do I, and we slept <laughs> on her floor, and um, yeah. Weird graphics connection. Yeah, totally. Um, yeah, I think like yeah, one of our bandmates had known her roommate or something like that. It was just wow. totally random. There's like such a music and comics connection, but I'm really glad that I didn't know who those people were when I first met them because I wouldn't have had the courage to get to show them my work. It was really good that I was just completely and then how did you unaware. Meet, oh, we'll, we'll no, go ahead. You can ask. Go ahead. I was gonna say, how did you go from that to like doing your first book with with Picture Box? Like, how did that? Um, uh, CF. It was c completely him. Like, um, he was just unbelievably kind and welcoming to me. Like, um, and I think he showed some of my, and Carlos Gonzalez, like those two are really tight, and um, and they showed, I think, some zines of mine to Dan Nadell, and then Dan Nadell for many years was just selling my shitty zines. And then your book that he published actually killed the company though, right? <laughs> yes, it, it put them out of business. It was such a, it just, it was like a meteorite. It just hit, it uh, hit picture box and, and it went extinct. Okay, well, that was some good anecdotes there. Now we're gonna—I'm gonna shift gears a little bit in another th differentiating aspect from this generation to the earlier generations of cartoonists. Well, the earlier primary generation of cartoonists for Fantagraphics is the in, in between the two generations, the internet came about, and you know, sort of more or less changed so much about how comic books are, you know brought to the attention of the public, how are they created, how you think about what you're doing, and, and et cetera, et cetera. And I guess all of you, you know, have, a, you know, there's a great variety of, of, of approaches, you know, to using, you know, some people, some of you like, you know, pr print your comics, produce some of them specifically for the internet, some of them are, you know, you use the internet to promote your print comics, and, you know, most of you do both. And, and then, if, and I just sort of want to, Bring, and then there's, of course, you have your own websites, do, and you're selling your comics online, and then social media. And so there's so much that of your comics practice that you have to take into consideration how you're going to employ the internet, and you know what is a, what's necessi necessary, what's optional, and how your path, you know, again, you know, in the context of your path towards fanographics involving the internet, which is something, you know, you know, probably for possibly all of you, you know, the people, you know, the publishers first encountered your work online rather than in print, I mean, in some cases. And so I, I want to talk a little bit about, you know, you know, specifically you know, how, you know, I guess we could start with, you know, did all of you, it sounds like all of you first did print product in, for comics, like no one started by posting on the internet. That's like, that's even more recent than you guys. So everybody started with print. And so when you started to, you know, use the internet, it sounds like it would have all been in support of your print projects and, you know, and how yeah. did you view that, you know, the, the synergy, and et cetera, between the two? <laughs> hey guys, um, I think whenever I post comics on the internet, there it's like a, I think of it as the print comic is the real thing. Right. Like, the original page with the, my hand drawing on it is not the real thing, and the copy of it that's online is not the real thing, but like the printed book is the actual art. art. Um, that's the finished work. So I think of my online presence as far as my art as just documentation of the print work that I do. Um, I developed my drawing style, which is very like uh, just black and white lines, no, no gray tones or, uh, or color, um, because it photocopies well. And I make all my, all my minis on copiers and I lay them out like at the print shop. I don't lay anything out on the computer at all. Right. But I sell a lot of work online. Like right. I sell work on Etsy. That's like 
probably the majority of my income from comics is by selling books online. Okay, now how are the people, I mean, then, but they're, they're guided to your Etsy through I don't another. Know how. You, but I mean, but I mean, how do, do you have a Tumblr? Is it you say Tumblr? I have a Tumblr, I have I mean, a Twitter, I have a Facebook page that I don't use. Do you have anymore. your own website as well? I do. And then, so there's like, if you show, like, here's my new comic, and then you have a link to your Etsy page that where they can buy it? I mean, yes. Okay. Um, yeah, we are all in our mid 30s, so we did grow up pre internet, and I think right. that's why we all come from like bookmaking. So, right. I'm, I'm late 30s. Yeah. <laughs> But, yeah, I, I, you know, made the zines for years. I always think of the printed book as the, the real thing, like you said. I, I didn't like web comics for a long time. I found them scary and weird. Um, I was in a bit of a slump in, like, 2008, and I read Dash Shaw's Body World online, and I thought that was just, like, that was, like, the best web comic I'd seen and still think it probably is the best one I'll ever see. It scrolled really well. It was, it was fucking great. And it got me out of a slump, and I started drawing real hard, and uh, eventually people convinced me to put stuff on Tumblr. And I was like, okay, like, I guess... I had a problem with giving work away for free. Like, I work so hard on this shit, I gotta be, like, playing these noise gigs and playing my book, selling the books at the noise gigs. But, yeah, put it all online, and it worked out. Fanographics uh, wrote to me. I was always too scared to submit anything. I was like, I suck, like... Uh, Healthy criticism, like you need to hate yourself and, uh, <laughs> and 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 strive to be better with every project. But yeah, Mark Palm, a, a Seattle cartoonist who works sent down on the phones at Fanographics, he saw it on Tumblr. Saw Megan Mog, told Jack Cohen, the publicist there, publicist there, and she pushed for it. It eventually happened. Jack Cohen and I got married in the end um, through through comics, uh, which was beautiful. <laughs> but yeah, you know, books. Fanographics books. Uh, yeah, for me, uh, it was really important to print um, my comic the way, like a, a traditional comic was printed. Right. You know, and, and I wanted it on newsprint, uh, and so I, I, I was, it was very important to me that it would be, and it had to be the exact dimensions. I remember the printer told me that uh, I would have to pay extra. To have those dimensions because it wasn't like fitting their press, their press web it. or yeah. whatever, and I was like, charge me whatever it needs to be that size. I don't, I don't care. Like right. it has to be this size, so it was very important. Um, but yeah, print was always was always like the the main goal. Um, but then I, I sold things online, which was annoying, and. Uh, then, yeah, I've obviously promoted stuff. But the thing about the internet that's great is um, I remember, you know, I come from an era when we didn't have such a thing. And uh, finding out about stuff was always just like these, these specters that sort of like hovered. Like you hear about a cool band or hear about cool comics. You didn't have access to any of that information unless somebody, you know, somehow was able to acquire that stuff. Uh, but now it's just, you know, on my phone. Basically, I can just like access any sort of like artist I want to look up. So it, it's a it's a it's an amazing resource for that as well. And then uh, yeah, obviously uh, Instagram is like my main thing now. Like that's become basically like my blog. But I'm I'm very also very intrigued by what Patreon can do. I'm not sure though about it. We'll see. I just want to judge. just sure, like all the, all the old weeklies are gone. Like that's not a gig you can have anymore. Like a print gig for an alternative cartoonist. So yeah, like, sure. Like Vice is one of the only gigs you can get as a cartoonist to get that visibility. And yeah. But you have to use the internet these days. Right. Well, yeah. I mean, it's in that, I mean, that's that's but, in that's know. in the year because you guys are still even. And that's well, we'll get to that. Let us finish. Yeah. Sorry. That's yeah, okay. Sorry. No. We're not. <laughs> no. Yeah. No, I, no. The print is always the the like end goal. And so, like, I, I still, like, I'll serialize a lot of my books on the internet just because it helps the, the print version sell better. Like, I think, uh, like, for St. Cole, I, I serialized it all on this website. I started with my friend Joseph. And Fonte Bukowski was just all taken from my Tumblr page. And same with, like, My Hot Date and stuff. And now, like, I just like doing that because I like the, to, to see the, the people's reaction quicker than, I, you know. And actually, like, it helps get the word out about whatever I'm working on so that when it comes out, everybody's familiar with it and they want to buy it, you know? Well, just since you said that, I'm just curious because you say you like to see people's reactions. Have you yeah, ever, yeah. like, gone in and edited and made changes based on those reactions? Or do you just... Yeah, well, I, so I have a Patreon where I've been posting all the pages for the new Fonte Bukowski book as I do them. And uh, 
uh, one of the storylines in there, it, somebody was like, you know that there's like this big thing in the New Yorker about this motel that like has secret like hallways and stuff where people can peep in on your rooms and stuff, and it's apparently like a big deal. And uh, that was happening in this book I was working on. So I had to, I had to like go through and change that whole part of the story oh, okay, okay. because people were people started commenting on my Patreon like, yeah, I don't I was wondering about that. Were you influenced by that New Yorker article or this book that's coming out and all this stuff? So, yeah, it was actually good because that would have sucked if I didn't know that. And then right. the book came out and people were like, hey, you just ripped off this thing. Right, right. So, funny so in that way, it worked for me. But other, other times, like Early if, people, morning. <laughs> if people criticize me about some things that I feel pretty strongly about, I just don't listen to them. I, okay. go I was just curious because you brought that the thing. I yeah. Get yeah. people's reactions. Yeah. Um, I, I feel really lucky that I made my first book like – entirely like I wasn't on Tumblr or Twitter or any of that and I'm glad that I just because I don't think I would have had the confidence like I just needed the space to just be completely like in my own head and to just be like like to have that that quiet and like not all those voices coming at me um I started um the book that I did with Fanagraphics um Band for Life uh started on Vice and then after it was discontinued it was on vice for about nine months and um after that it was discontinued and i just continued to put it up on my tumblr for like a, a subsequent year and it has been nice to like hear feedback from people and get encouragement but um and yeah i sell stuff on store envy um you know and i and i love you know following the work that my friends are making but overall i do feel kind of tormented by it i, I really feel like it feels like like a an addiction, and it, it doesn't feel good to like wake up in the morning and want to check that. And I I would love to just be able to like completely sever myself from it. It feels unhealthy. It's a necessary evil. I don't know. Yeah. Right, dance right. with the devil. Well, that's like again, <laughs> and that's the interesting thing too, because I mean, again, just to, I'm trying to you know the theme is like contrasting you know your experience with previous you know. Before people would send stuff, fanographics, fanographics, or any major publisher, regardless, you know, you would, oh, I got the publisher, and then the the publisher's job is to publicize me and get my book out there, and all I have to do is do my work, and the publisher takes care of everything else, and that's like I, I just become, I'm just the creator, but it, you know, your path to being published now, almost of necessity, involves self promotion to get into the attention. Of, of the publishers and in some other mediums, you know, in, in some cases that, you know, the, 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 they just want to buy your audience, you know, like some, you know, and people in, in other media, especially like, you know, larger media, you, know, you build up this entire thing and then you, you have it and then they just buy it. For, and there's, you know, comics isn't quite that, that, uh, that cut and dry, but, and, and it seems that, so A, you have to, to get published in the first place, you need to, to you know, self-promotion is a much larger part of your, like, hourly consumption of labor to than it was in the past you would just go and go and go and then you would either make it or you wouldn't and now it's a longer train but two even though you guys are now all published by fanographics it's not like oh i never have to publish much size myself again i can just let them do it all i'm done it's it you're still having to stay in the game to some degree like and there's this fear kind of not necessarily fear but like like what if i just said oh i'm leaving it all to them i'm not going to ever publicize myself again I'll leave it all to them. I mean, like, that's a kind of a quandary, just like Anya just said. Like, it would be great just to not have to do it, but you kind of, yeah. is there any, is there an exit to that? There's limited outlets for, that will write about comics. Like, I'm married to a publicist, so I hear, you know, we talk a lot about this stuff, but, you know, Fantagraphics publishes like 100 books a year, and not everything, you know, people aren't clamoring to write about comics in, like, mass media, so it's, you're fucking lucky if you can gain a foothold and get that kind of publicity. And like, you, you need to do it yourself. You need to right. also be dancing with the devil and you know playing that Twitter game and you know a avoiding Candy Crush and <laughs> just yeah doing it as minimum as possible. But yeah, you know Ed Piscor is really good at doing that. Yeah. Um, he's, he's, he's disciplined. He's the master. Yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't know how he does it. So. Right. But I mean, you know, it's just it's just a willingness to sort of share what you're working on. And, uh, you know, that can be exciting just to see from, you know, I, I really love looking at artists' process shots, you know, just like with the, you know, the pencils of something or just an unfinished page. That's really interesting to me, or, or character designs. So that... That becomes a part of the promotion to me is 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 just uh, just just 
the 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 need to share uh, whatever it is that's on the table at that time. We well, use incorporated. Do you have like I guess do you have like a I guess maybe well keep going. I'll add that to the no, I'm, question. No, I'm done. That's what I say. Like the thing is like you all like learning like being a self publisher is really a training ground because you have to be your own publicist. Right. But that that never ends. Like if Fantagraphics publishes your book, the way I see it, it's like they just spent thousands of dollars publishing my book and then now it's my job to make sure that people know that this book is out there. You feel even more guilt now. Yeah, right? I, now I have to do that. And like not having to do that is something that you earn. Like like for example, like Daniel Klaus doesn't have to be on social media. Right. right. You know, like all these bigger guys, they don't have to do that stuff, but they like earned that. And I'm, I'm hoping in like another 20 years I can get off of Facebook. <laughs> there so it like is. right now, like I'm that's not there the yet. That's all, you know. Uh, Dan, Dan does have social media, but he has someone else running it. Yeah, yeah, right, yeah. Right, okay. right, right, yeah. right. Yeah. yeah. That'd be great if like somebody else did mine for me. Well, it's just a matter of making enough money to pay someone to do it, I guess. Yeah. I'll do it for you, no? No, uh, I don't want to. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, do you have anything to add on that one? I mean. I guess you, we sort of started with you, so I guess you're. Yeah. But I guess I, I guess do you, okay, do you have a? Uh, uh, I guess we have this. You know, like a, I guess how do I want to say it? A uh, 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 a schedule or a, a, a sense of like what percentage of like your, do you have, do you divide your workday? Like I have my social media half hour or my website update half hour. You just it's just sort of randomly like oh I better do something I like, and it's just when it strikes and you have mutual inspiration shit. for when, you, when you're doing a shit yeah, yeah. 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 That, yeah exactly yeah. so you, when you're burnt out when, when you're tired from your comic or yeah. your inspiration yeah. flags then you might as well do that is that kind of there are like, any, there's certain times of day when you have to post stuff on different websites like i don't know if you guys time zones yeah. <laughs> you, you have you access to the, the master zones. algorithm of, yeah. of you, you this is freely available information right. it's like a, like on tumblr i think the peak time is like around 10 or 11 in the evening east coast mm. so i try to schedule my posts for then oh. <laughs> 10 11 exactly That's smart. The and it's yeah. i forget what it is on twitter it might be earlier in the day because people check twitter at work and yeah uh, so back yeah. in europe as well though yeah. Tilly Walden knows all of this. She actually did like a workshop at CCS about the perfect times on all the social medias to post your work. Wow. Right. So, yeah. My favorite time to be on social media is like at like four or five in the morning. So I think, <laughs> I don't know. Really that's, yeah, I don't think. <laughs> yeah, that's when I'm like, yeah, too tired to work on anything else and like, yeah. but like too jittery to go to sleep. So I, I think that's like most of my posts probably just get completely buried. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, Tumblr is dead as well. I mean, yeah. the, 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 yeah. since the, they sold the Yahoo. Yeah, the yeah. death rattle has been rattling away for a while now, but it's officially, it's officially fucking dead. Yeah. Okay, well, I guess, you know, I think all, everyone here, I think it's, it's been published, you know, obviously it's self published and then also been published by another publisher prior to Fantagraphics. Is that true for everybody? Or did, did you have? Did you go from self-publishing right to Fan, or did, were you published by someone else in between? I don't know. I was, I, I don't it's know, like the Sacred Prism or whatever. Oh yeah, well, well I had I had a book with with Picture Box that's unfinished. Oh, that's right. That 175 Whoa, really? page graphic novel right. that was is sitting underneath my bed right now. So you're saying like sitting like somewhere in Dan McDowell's? No way. Not Dan. <laughs> I would not do that. <laughs> um, no, it's it's with me. All right. It's it's a little bit. Uh, out of order right now, but I'll get to it one day. I think we'll see. Um, but no, I, 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 I mean, I've worked with like, you know, other sort of. Yeah, you've done a lot of. Now you're different from everyone here. of doing a lot of professional work for hire. Yeah, I do. I, I, mean, I did like, well, like Marvel or Valiant. Or right, but then you've also done like, like illustration for. Yeah, I do illustration things like yeah, a, that's stuff. a bigger part of your. I'm, I'm cutting that out actually because it's okay. just annoying. All right. Well, it's good you know. because you can. Yeah. Because you I actually am doing. I did the cover for this year's American Illustration Annual. Oh, oh sure, awesome. awesome. Yeah, it's coming out in November, and so I'm sort of like. That you're going out with a bang. Yeah, that's retiring it. Retiring like, illustration. <laughs> to, to tell you, like going out at the top. Yeah, it's like that's. I don't think it could do anything, like, more, for that. So right. I'm. Yeah, I don't know. I don't. I don't really like illustration because it gets in the way of making comics. Right, right. Well, that's what Jaime was saying yesterday. Um, well, I guess, is there any, uh, we're, I guess, well, Simon already answered the question about, like, he was always desired to be published by Fantagraphics, and now that you're all being published by Fantagraphics and you've been published by others, was did anyone else have the goal of, of, of being published by Fantagraphics, or can you contrast 
being published by Fan Graphics with your other publishers, any anecdotes or anything? Does anybody have? My other publisher went out of business. <laughs> 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 because <laughs> did he pay you? I heard he just sent you a box of books. And they said, there you go. He, he made Johnny Negron pay back in advance, and Johnny was really pissed off. Whoa. Yeah. Well, I, I didn't get an advance, so. Oh, there you go. <laughs> I heard That's he was better. paying 50% royalties, though, after, like, making back the print costs, which seems generous. But yeah. then I also hear he didn't pay a bunch of people, so who knows? Yeah, cash flow uh, was... Dan was after me. He was offering me, you know. I was like, ah, oh, but Fanographics, like... I loved Picturebox, but... Uh, sure. Yeah. But then he went out of business, and I probably would have just been sold to Fantagraphics anyway. Yeah, sort of right. divided his yeah. empire up. But no, but that sounded flippant. Like I also, I do, I love Fantagraphics, and I had always, like, ever since discovering those like legendary like undergrounds from the '60s and '70s, like that had been an ambition. I'm. It's not that like, oh well, like I had to go with Fantagraphics because no, like it was a, it was yeah. a huge. It was. It's been really exciting. 40th anniversary. Woo. Yeah. Okay, and I guess we'll segue immediately into like how, you know, we'll just, like, everybody has, you know, can answer like how did the Fanographics publication, you know, you being published by Fanographics come about? Did they contact you? Did you submit work? Did they send you an email? Did you get a call? Who was it? How did that happen? I already answered that earlier. Right, so yeah. I'm sitting this one out. Right. I, got, I think my hookup was uh, uh, Jason T. Miles, who I knew from. Yeah, he like, worked at Fana, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> What? <laughs> I work next to him in the office. He's crazy. He's <laughs> sweet. Oh, my grandfather was in the FBI. He's going to show up. Well, I knew He's him lovely. through, like, the Seattle art scene. And, like, so he had somehow, he, he we had friends in common, and he had seen some of my comics. And I think uh, that was how, I, I, you know, the, the Fanographics, like, website and stuff, there's, there, there's like a submissions page and then it's like actually don't yeah. <laughs> right. 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 so I had never uh, really like considered <laughs> submitting to them I was just like they don't want right. they don't want to hear from me so I was very flattered when he was like yeah I'll give it a look it's like hmm, okay and then we had like a back and forth for a long time where they were like yeah we're interested and I was like okay they're well, now you say we was that Jason or somebody or did he show Jason it to some and Eric yeah and Eric okay so yeah. he talked with Eric that's what you know okay and I, I didn't realize that meant like yes right I was <laughs> like they're still considering it but yeah that was how it okay and then it, and then it just happened and they just yeah. That happened. Okay. There was for a specific book that I had uh, I had self published. Okay. That they that was uh, black is the color that right. came out in 2013. Okay. Back in print. Back okay, in so, print. So Ben, so your first book was an original graphic novel, and how did did did, did, had, did you already completed it, and s or was no. that was that one in your So it, it's funny because uh, I I've been talking with Eric about doing something for a number of years, and we were like. Every, every so often you email me and be like, let's do a book. And I'd be like, yeah, okay, that sounds great. And then we just sort of like drop it. And then uh, I remember I, I put together a pitch of this story that I, I wanted to do and I sent it to him. And he was like, oh, this looks great. Let me see, you know, if other people around the office want to do it. And then I didn't hear back from them. So that's still sort of like in the drawer. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, Ed was like you guys got to stop fucking around and just do something and he got like an email together with right. me and Groth and Eric and was just like do it and then Eric was like well what do you want to do and then I sent him a bunch of ideas just like one sentence ideas and then I, I had done a single issue of Terror Assaulter Amwat for a micro publisher color code in Toronto and um, he was like yeah let's do that so I had done like the first chapter, right. and I just expanded that. So I hadn't done it, um, and then I just worked on it and turned it in, and that was it. So yeah, you had the agreement to do it, and then you went ahead. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, there you go. And then, and then, how did? And then, because of the success of that, they, I mean, or, or was it fait accompli already that you know the agreement to publish, republish, collect your traditional comics, self-publish work? When that was that was more like. He was like, all right, well, what do you want to do next? And I said, well, I have this. That that book had been originally published in Spain. Oh, with okay. a boutique publisher okay. called Outsider. I didn't know that. Before. And uh, it's it's like it's slightly bigger, but it follows a similar format. And there's mm -hmm. there's things in that that aren't in American Blood. But it was kind of weird because I went to Spain on like a tour and everything like that. I came back, I had the book, and I was I sent 
one of the Spanish copies to Eric, and I said, you know, we, we, it's already done, basically. We just, it's already in English. We don't <laughs> have to do anything, really. We just have to basically hit print. And, and that was, um, so that was the genesis of that. Uh, but we want, I want to do, my goal is to do a book a year. So I want to, uh, so that was sort of like the stopgap between Terror Assaulter and my next book for next year. And is that going to be the ill, ill-fated picture box book or a new no, one? No, that's going to, I'm going to finish off Night Business okay. for next year. Okay. So, All right. That'll be one volume. All right. No? Uh, okay. <laughs> I mean, yeah. So, so, yeah, I wanted to be like a, I wanted to work with them for a long time. Um, but around 2008 or so, they weren't really, after like the, the crash, the right, economic yeah, crash, yeah. they weren't really working with anybody new. But I, I was like, I got to work with them somehow. So I got a, a gig at the Comics Journal doing illustrated uh, cartoon interviews. <laughs> and then, uh, so I was doing those just to familiarize myself with like fanographics. And then I, I uh, emailed Eric and I was like, yeah, I do these interviews. I'd love to be in MoM. Is there any way I can get in MoM? And so he was like, oh, you can send me stuff if you want. So I started sending these like awful comics. And then he'd always like send them back with like rejected, but then like a little note about like what I was doing wrong. So I just kept doing that, like sending him new stories, and I wouldn't leave him alone. So finally, he published one of my comics in, in MoM, and I was like, well, that's it. Like, uh, now he's going to accept my book proposal. <laughs> and so, uh, yeah, so then a couple, maybe like a year and a half later or whatever, I sent him like the, the couple chapters of the hypo that I was working on. And, and uh, yeah, and he, he was already familiar with me from MoM and stuff, so he accepted that. But that was like my way in. Like, I had to like, it was like climbing like a staircase, like the comics journal, and then Moam, and then like my own book. And then you were still and at the same time having multiple other avenues. You were being published by Kilgore. Yeah, yeah. Lambo, I had a newspaper strip for yeah. like eight years. And all cool. Yeah, I did like a lot of stuff. But I, I really just wanted to work with Fanographics. And then after the hypo came out, um, I did, yeah, I did a book with Ad House. Because right. I'm the same. I, I wanted to do like a book every year. Like I feel like every year I should have like either a book or a comic or something coming out, you know, just to keep myself working. And, uh, and then from the hypo, it did pretty well, so we had a pretty good relationship. So I knew that, like, anything I, I pitched to them, they, they would work, they would work right. with me on. And so you've yes, you done quite yeah. a few now. Um, well, I think, I think Eric had read School Spirit, so I think he was familiar with that book. Um, and, um, oh, yeah, I was doing um, Band for Life on Vice, and... Um, so suddenly, like, I was noticing, like, oh, uh, these other cartoonists that I love, that I, you know, kind of worship, suddenly it seemed to know who I am. And I, so I think that that raised my profile a little bit. And um, my partner, Lane Milburn, is sitting in the back there. He's also published by <laughs> Fantagraphics. <Yeah>. Um, <laughs> um, he, he also had had a relationship uh, with Jason T. Miles, and that's like how he got into uh, into Fantagraphics, and then um, I think, uh, and so I think like the fan the fan of folks were like aware of my work, and then like I got to meet them in person through Lane and like um, Lane's book, uh, and then that's when we kind of I think it was at the Cake, the Chicago Alternative Comics Expo, I met them and. And we just kind of like had a verbal agreement to do um, Band for Life through them. Okay, well, we're, we have a little bit more time, and then we're going to open up to questions shortly. But I guess now that you've you know worked for your, you've self published, you've published for others, and you published for Fana, do you is the working for the work you produce for Fanagraphics? Do you feel like an obligation to does it motivate you to produce even better work to up your game because you know Fanagraphics is going to publish it? Or does it, is, it, is there any kind of the fact that it's being published by Fanagraphics and that you, you know, does that have any relationship to the, how you approach the work or is it no relationship at all? It's just like I'm going to do what I've always done and now Fan is publishing it. I, my work is always very good. They're lucky to have me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yep. No, I'm a, I always do my best. I, for, if it's self-published or like I don't want to put my name on stuff that's not up to par. Like, I think all the work that I do is worthy of them. It's it's the best that I'm capable of, so yeah. there's nothing more I can do. 
Uh, like I said, I, I go in the office and work in there quite often, and there's dogs running around and all these, like, dirty paper plates with holes in them in the corner of Gary's office and you know, things held together with tape and a uh, you know, smell. Um. <laughs> but, you know, so, you know, but yeah, obviously, I, you know, they're amazing and I want to do the best uh, job I can. My third book is due in December. I've been late on uh, both of my books. Everyone's late, so you know, it's not a big deal. It's a tradition at Fantagraph. No, it no, is. No, no, I hit my deadline. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. <laughs> But yeah, gonna gonna get it done this time. No more prescription painkiller addictions. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> oh, we say that every year. Yeah, every year. <laughs> I'm I'm sort of shocked that like my my comics get published anyway. You know that are out in the world, uh, even, whether or not I'm publishing them or somebody else's. So uh, you know, I I and and at a certain point, you just sort of like let the work be what it's going to be. I don't really have. At a certain point, you just like let the, you know, you let it go. You don't have any control anymore, and uh, so if, if if they if they sort of, you know, deem it, you know, something that's val enough value for them to publish, then that's great. But you know, I'm, I don't. Yeah, I, don't I guess really also, but that's part of the aesthetic is like you, you. I guess also added is that you don't worry too much about editorial interference. Right. As well. Yeah. And so, like, it's just as long as you know you're doing your best work, you're, you're comfortable that it's going to be accepted. Yeah, you can, you, you just have to do what you can do, and then that's it. It's already hard enough to, to produce one of these things, so, you know, it's going to be what it's going to be. They eventually. have, they've published some fucking garbage over the years as well. <laughs> 40 years in the business, you know, they can't all be winners. Right. right. Yeah. But that is, that is one of the great benefits of working with fan graphics is they just don't really have... I mean, unless I'm like missing some sort of like grammatical thing, by I'm off by a mile, they're not going to really tell me what to change at all. Right. I, I like the lack of editorial. Uh, you know, like I, Eric's my editor. We'll talk about it and maybe move a few things around. But they they trust you. Right. They, they once want you're you once to, you're in the fold, yeah. you're good to they, go. They just they yeah they you know, yeah they okay. just want our pure expression. All right. Mm -hmm. Oh, I, I don't like try to be a, a better cartoonist for fanographics. Like, <laughs> right. I just like try and like up my game with everything I do, so that everything is better. And I'm still not like where I want to be as a cartoonist, but I'm like getting there. And, uh, and I'm just happy that they're willing to like publish all that, and, like show all that that growth with everything, you know, but, every new project. And then it's a it's a it's a, it's a comfortable place to artistically grow. Without, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, like I want people to like look at whatever I did that's new and just be like, "Holy shit, how'd that happen?" I just read the hypo, you know. Right. I, know. <laughs> I think it's safe to say that none of us are really satisfied with yeah. like anything that we produce. That's the reason why we continue to make stuff. Right. Yeah. Going for the shining light. Yeah. Yeah, and if you compare yourself, I think like, I mean, we all have like, you know, our our artistic idols that we look up to and. Um, like Ben and I were talking earlier, like like just being in in the studio around these books that you you know just like kind of like absorbing their their magic and like just like take a little break, have a sip of coffee, look at some Spain Rodriguez, like go back to work, like um, but the, yeah the competition is is can only really be with oneself and um, yeah I'm I'm tremendously thankful if if anyone else cares but yeah it's it's primarily just like just a marathon that you're running with yourself. I definitely want to make them proud, though. I want to make Gary proud. Okay. All right, well, we have eight <laughs> minutes remaining, so then we're going to open it up to question and answers. There's a microphone on the left of the room and on the right of the room, or vice versa for you guys. So if anybody has a question, I would appreciate it if you speak into the microphone, if there's anybody who has anything to say. Okay, go ahead. You, you, can, go. I mean, you can walk to the microphone now if you have a question. Okay. Does this microphone work? Yes. Oh, great. Great. Um, I just wanted to um, congratulate you all on being published by Fanographics, for one thing, um, and sort of ask you, you're the next wave of this like huge uh, publishing company, and what do you think it is that makes you that? Like, What's drawing people to you that's going to define Fantagraphics the way you were drawn to you know, Klaus and Woodring and all those guys? 
Do you have any idea? <laughs> I just feel like I'm a big Peter Bag ripoff. It's just sort of like <laughs> Peter Bag 2.0. So it's the same thing they were doing in the 90s, but just, you know, an in, in, in internet y kind of aftertaste. So. <laughs> I, I think it's like. Um, I mean, for me, like, I was always drawn to a lot of the kind of social commentary that was, like, the thread running through the Fantagraphics books that I wasn't seeing from other publishers. There's always been, like, a thread of feminism, a thread of, like, lefty, like, punk aesthetic. So, to me, it really appeals to my, like, bleeding heart, like, angry woman, liberal uh, sensibilities. And I, I feel like I can, I'm, like, part of that, that continuum. I, I actually don't know. I don't yeah. know. I, I don't know. I, I, I'm, I'm glad. I'm happy to be here. But like, yeah, I've, I've, I, I'm, I don't really have like, any, like those guys that 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 came before or and are still operating today, are so huge to me, that it's hard to even think about being occupying the same sort of like, space as them. Well, I think part of what you're all saying is just there's a continuity of the values that were established by Fantagraphics with the first generation and the second generation is continuing that tradition of, you know, basically artistic integrity and personal expression that it isn't difficult to find in publishing in general, but then applying it to the generation that's coming up. And so when we have Fantagraphics 3.0, these will be the people that they grew up reading and referencing and it'll all continue. And that's the, <laughs> that's the goal I think we, everybody shares. Very incestuous. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, does anyone else have a question? I mean, well, does any, any closing comments from anybody who <laughs> want to just get the last word in about what we're, our, our theme of the future? Anybody want to say anything about the future, plug a future project, anything? I mean, we kind of did a little bit. I mean, I guess you all had premieres here and you're all going to continue to do new work. And so everyone here has something to look forward to. So. And, SPX 2017 rolls around, well, there'll all be new work from Fantagraphics and from some of these people to look for as well. Thank you all for coming.